Hey, Chris, how are you? Happy Wednesday. Yes, happy Wednesday. Oh, Hi, excited dude. to be here. It's like um, yesterday, it was so funny. I went to lunch and the guy was like, well, you're just three days away from Friday. And I was like, well, it's a good way to look at a Tuesday. But <laughs> Wednesday, we're, we're certainly getting there. It's kind of crazy to think. I don't know what it's like up there in California, but here in Texas, everyone's going back to school. So it's kind of wild to just say, oh, my gosh, we're already in August. And August is always a reminder for me that before we know it, the holidays will be here be in next year. So time flies. Yeah, I work with a lot of like teen and young adults. So um, everybody's going back to school either locally or they're traveling back to where it is. So I know we're doing a lunch and learn on like returning back to school, yes. which I'm excited about because literally, I mean, there's just so much stress with transitions and OCD. So I know a lot of people right now are on edge and they're stressed out because, you know, if they've been off all summer, then the transition back to school or moving out of uh, back into your dorms, roommates for the first time. Like there's so many things right now happening. So yeah. all of the above, all these changes that as we know, right? Changes in life stressors increase vulnerability and might impact OCD, anxiety and other things. So we'll be here to talk about that today. As always, please submit any live questions that you have. So if you have any questions about things you're going through, things you wanna know the answers to, Chris and I will do our best to address them. And we have a ton of pre-submitted. So I hope we can get to a lot of those today. And then of course, the last and final update um, is to just go through some of our housekeeping and then go through some updates as well. So a couple housekeeping issues. As always, this is not intended to replace therapy, but is instead intended to be educational. Chris and I do our best to provide education and helpful resources, but it should not replace your individual therapy. The IOCDF, our live streams, any of our events are not, uh, we are not a crisis hotline and we are not who you should reach out to if you're feeling suicidal or unsafe. We want you to call 911, go to your local emergency room or call the suicide prevention line and of course emergency services in your area. A couple super important announcements and updates. As y'all know, we do our webinars every Wednesday. Chris and I, every Tuesday night is Ethan and others on Community Conversations, Katie and a lot of other incredible people. The research roundtable is typically the second Wednesday of every month, and that's with Dr. John Abramowitz and Kyle King, but they are doing a extra research roundtable tomorrow where they're going to be doing Q&As and answering lots of questions, and I think Kyle's going to be talking with Dr. Abramowitz about a lot of questions he might have, so 100% make sure that you attend that and that you are there tomorrow, so that'll be tomorrow at noon. And then, of course, our other great announcement is that our Spanish conference is coming up. Our Spanish OCD conference, which is TOC, Trastorno Obsesivo Compulsivo, is how you say OCD in Spanish. It will be held, it'll be live online. So it'll be held on September 9th, I'm sorry, good, good Lord, 9-11, which is September 11th and through September 12th. So definitely make sure you attend um, and you spread the word because it's just so important that we make sure that the Latinx and Spanish speaking community is aware that we have this incredible resource um, available to all of them. So of course, go to iocdf.org for more information, September 11th through 12th, the Spanish OCD conference. Hope to see y'all there. So let's hop in. Hi, Grace. Hi, Hi, so many others. Um, so good to see y'all. We will be answering live questions and pre-submitted. And Chris, I'm going to challenge both of us today to see how many questions we can get through. And maybe we can get through a bunch. So one of us can answer. We can go fast. So I'll start with you. Do you know if there's any evidence to support hip that hypnosis may help with relieving the strength of intrusive thoughts? You know what? I, I'm always interested in looking this kind of stuff up because we always get questions like that. So a lot of times people ask about supplements, people ask about acupuncture, people ask about hypnosis, and I did not find any evidence. So, you know, Liz and I always talk about evidence-based. So what is evidence-based? In our field, it basically means that there's been double-blind um, you know, studies, there's been randomized control studies, there's been peer-reviewed studies. So basically, there's been a neutral institution to really study the efficacy of some kind kind of intervention on obsessive compulsive disorders. We've seen that with EMDR. We've seen that with other things. So right now there is no evidence to support hypnosis will relieve the strength of intrusive thoughts. So what I always strongly suggest for people is there is a lot of evidence-based treatments out there for OCD, whether that's medication, whether that's exposure response prevention with acts, um, exposure response prevention by itself, combined with medication, et cetera. So I would strongly suggest going to that before trying hypnotism because there just isn't any evidence that that helps in any way for OCD. That's right. So at this at this time, there is not any evidence to support that. Next question is, what's the difference between health anxiety and OCD health anxiety? Avoidance is used to cope. Avoiding doctors, books, shows about illnesses, et cetera. The fear is that the doctor will diagnose a deadly illness. 
Yeah. So there's, um, there's like health anxiety, health OCD, illness anxiety. I mean, technically what the DSM talks about the difference is, is like somebody can either have anxiety around currently having a um, illness. So they have an illness, they feel pain, they go to doctors, the doctors can't find it. So they go to specialists, they go and get medication, but they're feeling some kind of symptom. Health OCD is more around the fear that you are going to get a disease. So honestly, most of the time clients will have both. Um, sometimes it is purely just, I may get a disease if I'm not careful. I may have a health condition, cancer, et cetera, if I'm not super, super careful. Um, sometimes it's people are feeling pains in their stomach, their abdomen, their neck. They think it's some kind of misdiagnosed deadly disease. But the biggest component is what do you do about it? And so you already mentioned some of the things that people unfortunately do when they have this subtype. So it's a lot of Googling. It's a lot of looking things up, asking for reassurance, checking body feelings, taking medications, looking things up in message boards, doctor shopping. And so what happens is the OCD has convinced us there's something going on that's misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, and that doctors and experts are missing. And so people will spend many, many years going through that. And you almost start to have psychological effects of that, where you start to get to a point where you just co convince yourself, the OCD rather, that you can't go to work, you can't carry things, you can't lift things. And so what I always tell people is, you know, follow what your doctors are saying, especially if you trust them. The doctors know a lot more than the OCD. That's 100 percent right. And it's important to remember, you know, sometimes maybe I'm wrong in this. Chris, please tell me because you're a provider yourself. And you might disagree. But sometimes I I try not to focus too much on getting hung up on like, is it this or is it that? And instead focus more on the treatment, as Chris was mentioning. Right. So maybe it's what we used to call hypochondriasis, maybe it's health anxiety, maybe it's OCD, but we're probably going to do exposure therapy. We're probably going to start ask you to reduce avoidance behaviors and hopefully allow you to start living your life with freedom. All right. The goals should be yeah. similar. No, I agree. Like I said, sliver difference is one is about having it currently, one's about in the future, but I've never seen someone that's like strictly one. Typically I see where they're having both. They think they have something and they're going to also get something. Right, right. Um, next question is my daughter struggles with BDD and OCD as well. I would like some guidance about how to react to her comments so that I'm not feeding into the BDD. For example, how do I respond to comments about getting a nose job or that she needs to buy weight gain powder so she can get curvier? She doesn't need any of these things, of course, but in her mind, they are critically important and I'm not being supportive if I don't agree. Can you help us as parents understand how to best respond to these comments and requests? I think the biggest thing is what we always talk about is support. And, and I know that Liz and I both agree on this is it is a really difficult job as a loved one to try to handle this disorder without guidance. And so the recommendation is always to have a clinician that can work with you. And that way, the clinician can be the one that instructs the reason why you need to pull back on accommodations, on reassurance, on listening to confessions, right? If somebody will say, well, my loved one is refusing treatment, then what I recommend is you go and see a provider who specializes in the treatment of body dysmorphic disorder and OCD. That way you can work with them to kind of develop a step down plan with your loved one. I think the thing is a lot of times people feel like they're on this fence. Do I I can't reassure, so I should just abandon. And that's not it at all. You want to support and love the person, just not support and love the disorder. So for instance, if if you're having a loved one come up to you and say, look, I really need to get this, this, this nose job, et cetera. If you've been working with a clinician, what you could say is, hey, I really want you to address any kind of image focused stuff with your clinician. You have an appointment this week. I've been instructed to kind of step back, but I can tell you're in pain. I can see that you're hurt. Is there anything I could support you with using the tools you've received or is there anything you'd like to go do? I just can't get involved in anything image based. And so that would be ideal. Or like I said, if you're working with a provider to be able to have language to step down. Last thing I always tell people is, you know, your loved one most, how can you show support without engaging? It's not going to work to tell them your nose looks great don't need it or the opposite. Sure, let's go get it. So it's really just bringing them back to the disorder and letting them know that you're going to support them through the struggle. So it sounds a lot like being able to say something like, you know, I understand this is a concern, but I really, I love you, but I don't love your BDD. And so I, right. Like I'm wondering, Chris, could, could there be a supportive comment instead of like, like, you know, with OCD, we might not say something that might sound like reassurance, but with BDD, could there be something like, you know, um, I feel like this is your BDD talking, but like, I love you and love your body or like, would it be okay to say something like that? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you don't want to get into the reassurance trap, but you definitely could say like, you know, I, I think what helps 
um, people a lot of times is like, you know, just saying to them, like, I understand that you really feel like you need this. And I think that you're good enough. And I want you to get to a point where you're good enough and you enjoy and you like not only obviously your appearance, but who you are as a person. And I can tell that the BDD is really preventing you from feeling that way. And it's making you want to change something. I love you the way that you are. And I want you to get there as well. And that's why we're seeing, you know, therapist so and so to really, really help you with that. So, you know, it's it's definitely okay to let them know that that you love them as is and other people do as well and that you want them to get there too. Got it. Um, next question, also BDD related is Chris, did you ever feel like getting treatment for your BDD was just masking the fact that you were ugly? I think about that a lot. Yeah. So a lot of people with BDD will say that they're like, well, am I getting, you know, like, is everybody gassing me up or my therapist just, you know, really sitting there judging me and thinking I'm ugly, but, you know, gassing me up to get, you know, because they want me to get treatment. And, you know, it's really masking that, et cetera. The thing about it is typically people with BDD look normal or look attractive or above average. And so typically, you know, this isn't something I see often. So it's difficult because I don't ever want to get to where I'm like reassuring a client like, no, you look great, et cetera. But the way that the disorder is, is it has us see ourselves completely different. You know, I always kind of... Uh, bring up anorexia nervosa because people seem to understand that a little bit more. And if you've ever met somebody with that um, disorder, they look perfectly fine. But to us, it feels like, you know, I mean, to them, it feels like they're they're so thick and they're so heavy. And people will say, well, how do they see themselves as heavy? If anything, they look underweight. It's the same with BDD, whatever body part that you're focusing on, you are convinced it looks the way that it looks. And so that's what the treatment is really helping you do is gain that insight, having you see yourself as is. But at the end of the day, I know this sounds cheesy, but I really truly believe it. I don't think people are ugly. I mean, I think somebody has to be just a horrible human being to be ugly. And so, you know, people with with BDD like OCD are very black or white. I'm ugly, I'm hideous, et cetera. And typically their evidence in their life doesn't show that. They've been in relationships, people find them attractive, et cetera. And so I would trust that if you ask that question and you're here, it's because people around you have told you that it's not you don't see what, what you actually look like and you need help for a mental health disorder instead. So I trust that. That's right. Um, what are your thoughts or sorry, what are some examples of exposures for real event OCD? So we're kind of jumping from BDD to real event OCD. So maybe you could just briefly touch on what real event OCD is and then examples of ERP. Yeah. So real event OCD is where somebody, you, you know, sometimes you hear false memory. That's more so when an event didn't happen. But real event OCD, an example would be like, let's say like when the Me Too movement came out, a lot of people were like, well, I was in college. I was drinking at parties like I hooked up at parties. Did I ask for you know, consent. Maybe I didn't ask for consent. I think I had more, she had more alcohol than I did. Maybe I took advantage of her. So it's some event where at the time it was really like a non-event. You didn't really think of it much. You kind of moved on from it. It really didn't hit a radar. And then something happens typically, but not always. I see that it's years later and OCD likes it to be years later because your brain has moved on. You, you know, you don't remember it word for word, detail to detail, like it happened yesterday. And like I said, you'll see something on TV about, you know, um, uh, me too. And then you'll think, oh my God, am I that person? And then sometimes clients will like research the person and look them up and see if they look sad or if they're posting anything about me too, or they're afraid that they're going to get found out or, you know, somebody's going to show up and knock on jail. And so the, the worst thing that people try to do is a mental compulsion, typically mental review, trying to replay that old event, remember all of those details and get clarity. And so the thing that happens there is the more that you try to figure it out, the more cloudy it becomes and OCD starts to put in details and inevitably those are terrible. So obviously response prevention is key, reducing and eliminate mental compulsions, not reviewing, tolerating the fact that you will not have clarity because if you did, you wouldn't be ruminating about it. And then finally, whatever avoidances you're doing, that could be the exposure. So in this case, like with the Me Too movement, it's making sure that you don't overread articles for facts and information that can become compulsive, but it wouldn't be like swiping off of something if, a, if an image popped up. I know for clients, because this came up a lot during that time, it's like if they're reading an article and like, you know, a, a link to other articles popped up with that, they would swipe out. So it'd be able to read things as normal, watch things as normal, go on social media as normal. And if the, you know, if the um, image of like a Me Too or something like that pops up, it's not avoiding it. But a lot of our response prevention and dropping mental compulsions. What are your thoughts, Chris, on TMS for OCD treatment? 
Yeah, so I would say as of right now, TMS, what I've seen, it's it's not always recommended as a first line. You know, we still uh, recommend SSRIs and medication. Um, may, I always tell people, make sure that they use the right coil. There's a coil that they use for TMS. Um, and typically it's for depression, but there's definitely a coil for OCD. So you just want to talk to that provider and make sure. I have had clients use it for depression and have success. So if they've absolutely tried a lot of different medications and they haven't found anything to work, they found that TMS has really, really helped for depression. I would say, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not um, uh, working in that field. I, I don't do TMS. I'm not a, um, a, a clinician that typically a therapist doesn't do TMS. But what I will say is I haven't had a lot of clients that have tried it for OCD. Um, so what I would say is the best thing that you could do is like actually in the building that I work in, there's the TMS center of Orange County. Um, so we're supposed to have a meeting soon. So I might have more information for you, but I think what would be best for you is to talk to them. I would strongly suggest trying medication first. And if anything, I'd work with a psychiatrist to see if TMS works best for you. Love it. Um, should we hop to live questions and then we'll go back to yeah. minutes? All right. Awesome. So I'll throw some out to you. So the first one is at 12.05. It's from Ju Young Kang, and it says, what if you did something extremely horrible when you were 13 that targets uh, real event targets around POCD? Would this make it true? The real events were extremely horrible. You know, this is a great question, and this is what we get a lot, right? So oftentimes real event OCD might still be rooted in something that happened, right? Or, or in a real event or situation that we can't change. But the difference is, is did something happen that now our OCD is latching onto? So what you'd wanna do is work with your provider to figure out where is the OCD latching onto? Just because if some of it isn't OCD related, but you're trying to process a situation that happened or what you went through, the work is gonna be different, right? We don't wanna treat something as OCD when it's actually kind of processing past situations or past events or trauma or whatever you know could be going on. But if OCD is latching on now, we want to treat OCD. That doesn't mean the way we treat it is that we pretend this thing didn't or did happen, right? It's really about learning to accept situations past and moving forward in our life. Yeah, 100%. Um, we have a question at 1202 from Yellow6100. Um, what's your opinion on Dyko, Dyko, Dr. Michael um, Greenberg's rumination-focused ERP? Yeah, so what I want to make really clear is that ERP should always address rumination. There is no such thing as effective ERP where we're not addressing mental compulsions. Because for those of us who live with OCD, we know that a mental compulsion feeds the OCD cycle the same way an external compulsion does. So the thought of, okay, well, um, we're going to go do these exposures, whatever they might be, but we're not going to focus on if we're doing mental compulsions, we're not going to have success, right? Remember, you have to do exposures with response prevention, which includes addressing rumination as part of a response. That's a ritual, right? The response prevention really stands for ritual prevention. And so I think it's absolutely critical that rumination is being discussed and being addressed. What I don't know as much about um, as far as how people focus on it or not, what I will say is that to just say don't ruminate is something that isn't always going to, like not isn't always, is rarely ever going to work, right? For those of us with OCD, if we could just not ruminate, if we could just not wash our hands, we wouldn't, right? We're not, we don't enjoy these behaviors. We don't, we do them because we feel like we have to. And so we need support. And so what we actually know is that if we're doing ERP and focusing on the core fear, the rumination will start to go away. So yes, at first we have to not ruminate and commit to that when we're doing ERP, but we also need to focus on the fear that causes us to want to ruminate, right? If we're just suppressing rumination by like, I can't do that, I'm not gonna do it, it's gonna keep being there and be loud and in your face. Agreed, yeah. No, and, and a lot of times I remind clients that rumination is a compulsion. I think sometimes people are like, I can't help from ruminating. Um, so I'm gonna take it from Michelle Hoffman at 12.08. She asks, how would a teen with OCD who has mild Asperger's be treated differently than one without Asperger's? And are there specialists for this comorbid combo? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually did a webinar, Chris and I did on ASD and OCD. And so I definitely recommend that you check that out. The treatment is different, just like the treatment should, first of all, 
if we have 10 people who have only OCD, all of their treatment should look different as well because we're meeting each individual where they are. But certainly when we start thinking about comorbid conditions, whether it's BDD, whether it's TRIC, whether it's TICS, whether it's ASD, treatment will look different and we will approach things differently. Um, one example is that sometimes when we're doing OCD treatment for someone with ASD, we want to tease apart what part of the rigidity is ASD focused versus OCD and what are the goals, right? Because sometimes the goals might be different. The individual, for example, may need some more concrete understanding of like what is what is a normal hand wash? What is a normal shower routine? And we might spend more time really mapping out what is normal? What is the goal to try to get to that? Where with someone with OCD alone, we might look at that as more of reassurance of like, well, we don't want to give you this rigid kind of system that you have to work within, where for someone with ASD, maybe that helps them function better. And that's actually what would be valuable. And so it's really about kind of figuring out what their needs are and what's going to work best for them to help get them functioning and get them independent in various ways. There are definitely specialists who individuals who specialize in both ASD and OCD. So when you are looking at IOCDF or any of the resources, look for somebody who specializes in both. At 12.07, uh, Chitanya asks, um, she's recovered from OCD significantly and she had OCD since childhood. Now she's being triggered by her father. It seems like he has a personality disorder and she's worried about relapsing from that. So, you know, maybe you can speak to like, if you're at a place where you're really managing the OCD and then maybe like in this case, like her dad, because of his personality disorder is really triggering the OCD. How can you prevent that from creating any kind of relapse? Yeah. So the first thing I always say is that there is nothing wrong. We should have zero shame or stigma in re-engaging in treatment, especially if we start to see there's some external things that are going on that are kind of triggering us, making us feel a little bit more anxious, a little bit more vulnerable. Why not seek treatment and why not get support to work together with a provider? What I will also say is that we have to take care of ourselves and help ourselves set healthy boundaries in order. Otherwise, it will impact our mental health. And it makes sense that our OCD would start to pick up. Because again, if we're feeling vulnerable, we started the webinar today talking about school going back, things being busy, like, you know, how holiday season coming up, all those vulnerabilities and life stressors have a chance to really increase OCD. Yeah. Um, and I, and you know, you always talk about, it, and we always talk about it as like making ERP a lifestyle and, and, you know, really what was that look like? Well, that looks like at expecting, I mean, I always tell clients like factor in each day, something's not going to go the way you'd like. So unfortunately we can't get rid of our family members. So they can definitely be triggering sometimes. For sure. Victor on YouTube asks at 12.08, hello, I'm a gay guy and I have OC like sexual orientation OCD, so straight OCD for three years. I live in an extremely homophobic country where most therapists are anti-LGBT. I would like to ask if it's possible to cure OCD myself. You know, absolutely it is possible to treat OCD on your own. There's amazing self-help websites, self-help books, um, and there's also lots of different options that exist. I don't know where you live, um, but what I will say is that there's also therapy that's done via telehealth so that you may be able to find a therapist who can actually support you in helpful ways and be able to help move the needle for you if you do want treatment. So definitely look into that. Um, but if you go to iocdf.org, there's amazing resources for various self-help options. And then of course you can watch webinars and different things to help get some advice and feedback about how to treat OCD. What I will also say is I wonder if there are any OCD specialists where you live, if they're anti-LGBT, which is very disappointing and sad, I'm wondering if at least they could give you some good resources on OCD in general, that then you could use those tools to apply it to your own um, sexual orientation OCD that you're dealing with. But we definitely have webinars. We definitely have educational information through IOCDF and then also see if there's any, any providers who might be able to provide treatment telehealth. Otherwise, there are incredible self-help resources. What I want to during OCD, I want us to think about what treating OCD means, right? It's learning how to manage our symptoms and, and live freely despite our diagnosis. And so if you really have a good understanding of OCD treatment generally, right, you can then apply it to different subtypes, whether it's sexual orientation or whatever you might be dealing with. Yeah, I just wanted to say real quick, like, first of all, this is why I like that we talk about it as sexual orientation OC, because we do have people that are gay who have sexual orientation, intrusive thoughts that they might be straight. We also have people that are trans that have or, um, intrusive thoughts about potentially being cisgendered. So it can impact both sides. Um, you know, a lot of therapists are, are um, you know, LGBTQ affirming. So I'm so sad that it's not in your country. 
Um, we don't see that in your country. I would say the last thing that I would definitely recommend is what Liz talked about. I even have clients sometimes that come in and they have such um, shame around their intrusive thoughts. So they might not even open up to me about what they are, but they learn the treatment. So, right, right. Um, Gentile asks at 1208, is it possible to relapse from OCD? I feel like I'm slowly relapsing. Um, is it possible to relapse from OCD? So, um, like, yeah, if you live with OCD, you absolutely can have a relapse. Um, and there's a couple different things we call one a lapse and one a relapse. So a lapse is when we've had OCD treatment, we're managing symptoms really well, but maybe we're experiencing a big trigger and we're starting to see an increase in our symptoms and we're starting to see our OCD pick up. A relapse is defined as going back to kind of our worst state of severity in our worst place. So I would say if you feel like you're slowly relapsing, you haven't relapsed yet. Um, but either way, whether you're experiencing a lapse or a relapse, there's 100% treatment for you and you can get back on track. And what it's all about is re-engaging in treatment. So I want people to think a lot about, um, I remember when I was seeing a nutritionist once and I was like, well, like I already ruined the week, so I'll start back over on Monday, right? That famous saying of like, I'll start my diet on Monday. And I remember one of the comments she said to me is, so Liz, if you were driving to Austin and you got a flat tire, would you slip the other three? I was like, well, no, like, of course I wouldn't. I would fix my one flat tire. And she's like, oh, that's interesting, right? But think about it like that is that we're going to have times where OCD gets the best of us, where triggers happen and, and where we find ourselves even kind of slipping or falling in different ways, but we can 100% get back on track. The tools and treatment that you've had that's been successful, that doesn't change and you get to have that forever. And so I don't even want us to get black and white and feel like we have to define it as a lapse versus a relapse or what's going on. And instead I want us to focus much more on like, Oh, like I'm seeing an increase in my symptoms. Let me, let me re readdress how I'm going to work ERP into my daily life. Yeah, no, well said. And, and I would say too, it's like the sooner you kind of jump back into your tools, the better. Um, Chris asks on YouTube at 1209. I just started ERP today and feel optimistic, optimistic rather. I obsess on obsessing. Like, what if it's not OCD? And what if I like the thought? This together with existential OCD and DPDR. Can you, um, I think depersonalization, derealization. Um, can you speak about DPDR and OCD? So first I'm going to say, amazing. I'm so, I guess the first time I think I've seen someone say they started ERP today. So I'm just like, yay, this is so exciting. So awesome. You're on step one. And I'm so happy to hear you feel optimistic. I also want to caveat that with like, you're at day one. So let's expect that you're just learning and you're going to keep learning and keep growing. And you should keep learning and growing about obsessing about obsessing about your diagnosis, about what treatment will look like. And we wouldn't expect people to know everything at the beginning. So that's awesome that you are getting started. Um, very common subtype of OCD to worry about what if this is an OCD? What if this is something else? What if this is me? Remember, that's actually why OCD sticks, right? OCD sticks because we feel like, or our OCD makes us feel like, what if there's some truth? What if there's some validity to this thought or to this belief? If we were able to say like, we know this is totally irrational and we have zero concern about it, the thought wouldn't stick. We wouldn't do rituals around it because we don't enjoy the rituals. We do them because it feels like there's this potential risk, right? That there's a chance that this thing could come true or that this might be the case or whatever the situation is. Um, as far as depersonalization and derealization, there, um, I don't know that we've done a webinar on that, Chris, have we? No, we should. We, we definitely should. should. Um, you know, I think that what'll be really important to do is to really understand how one impacts you versus OCD, if that makes sense. So sometimes, like, I'm curious if, any of the existential OCD and DPDR is actually like comorbid in the sense that is it DPDR or is it OCD making you think you're experiencing, not making you think, but making us feel, I don't know, Chris, what are your thoughts? I'll let you hop into. Yeah. You know what? Um, the one good thing that I'll say is that a lot of the treatment for DPDR is very similar to OCD in the sense of the mistake that most people make when they're experiencing derealization or depersonalization is they try to get away from the feeling. They try to get out of the feeling and they try to run from it. And the problem is the real reason that you're experiencing what you're experiencing is because your body's in total intense anxiety. And so your brain needs a, a, a release. And so disconnecting kind of from ourselves or from the world around us, we typically see DPDR and either OCD or, or intense trauma 
trauma. And so your brain is trying to escape this very triggered situation, even if you're not triggered. I mean, that's what's so frustrating about both OCD and DPDR. It's like, we, we don't even need to be like really triggered. It can be a thought, it can be image, et cetera. And so typically what happens is clients will try to get to the point where they're trying to get out of that feeling. They don't like the feeling. They fixate on the feeling. They try anything that they can to get out of it. And by that very act of trying to jump out of it, they find their anxiety increase, which just makes the you know disassociation experience increase. And so just like OCD, what we're going to do is we're not going to fight it. You know, think of it kind of like a fly in a spider web. It's like instead of trying to get out of it quickly and rush, we're going to get out of it slowly. So typically what helps with this is acceptance as well as grounding. You know, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, it, 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 we feel out of ourselves. So kind of grounding in our, you know, in our surround surroundings can really help checking in with your senses mixed in with like the acceptance of your present condition and recognizing that it's temporary and it will pass. Um, but I usually see this also when people have existentialism OCD. So like Liz pointed out, you really want to make sure you're working on that. What I've seen sometimes with my clients is what's the OCD gets managed, the derealization, depersonalization, or if they have both gets managed as well. So a lot of times that existentialism is the component because you get caught up in this whole thing. Like, am I really here? Is this a simulation? Like, is life have meaning? And then you kind of get existential, you get overwhelmed, and then you kind of check out of, of your surroundings. I do think a full uh, webinar would be great on it because a lot yeah. of people experience that. Skyla, if we could write that down, that would be amazing. All right, maybe Chris, let's do a couple more live and then we'll jump back to other ones. Yeah. Um, so fall on YouTube asks at 1215, I have recently been suffering from scrupulosity or religious OCD for nearly two months. It sounds like this is a subtype that changed recently because they've been dealing with OCD for five years. Any advice would be appreciated. It's making my memory really foggy and it's frustrating because I've kind of forgotten what I studied. So I think they mean with religion. So yeah. um, it sounds like that subtype switch happened and now they're not sure how to deal with this subtype. Totally. And, and I'm wondering if when you said, I forgot what I'm studying, you might have also meant you forgot what you studied. You may have meant that like you forgot how to do OCD treatment if it's morphed. And so I want to kind of answer both. So first and foremost, it is normal for when, if we haven't experienced a certain subtype, when we have a new one to kind of say, Hey, can I get a little refresher on how to do treatment for this? Right. And so Yes, we want to make sure that you understand the concepts across the board and that we get them. But sometimes we need a provider to kind of keep us a accountable, but to just remind us and make sure we're on track and doing ERP the right way. So first and foremost, I would say definitely reach back out to your clinician and just get a little refresher, right, to just kind of revamp from an OCD lens around scrupulosity of what does this look like. The second piece is that OCD will confuse you, right? It will rob you of the joy and freedom of your faith, and it will make you confused. Am I doing things right? What do I remember? What do I not remember? Um, is this how I'm supposed to respond to certain things? Does God want something done one way versus the other? You name it. And so that all makes sense. But the way we're going to approach that is with active ERP, which is really about getting you back to enjoying your faith the way you want to and not having to know everything right? The end goal of treatment across the board is can you enjoy those things that are important to you without having to be certain or sure of anything really, and be able to just live and enjoy it freely. What I always like to say about scrupulosity as well is like faith is supposed to be something that enhances your life. You know, I grew up in the Greek Orthodox church. My dad's Catholic and active in the church. And for me, it's like faith is always supposed to be this thing that enhances your life. And when I work with clients that have scrupulosity, they're never happy and they don't feel connected with their God. If anything, they feel disconnected. They're very much more focused on like the ritualistic components of faith. So the praying, how often should I pray? Am I having the right thoughts about God? And that's not really what faith is. And so that's why we always kind of say like, once you get to a point where you understand your subtype, you're working on exposures, I always try to get clients out of the content and move towards the mechanics of the OCD because OCD is really good on picking things you care about. So if it's focusing on your faith, it, it's hard to do treatment because you're like, I, I don't want to risk angering God. So if we can get out of the mindset that it's about God and more so about the OCD. That's right. 100%. We have a question from LinkedIn at 1217 from Elena. She says, a friend of mine has severe OCD and he has depression, anxiety, and ADD. The problem is since he started to treat um, his OCD medically with all the best meds, he is way worse than before. His anxiety is worse. His obsessions are 10 times worse than before. How is this possible? Why are OCD meds worsening his obsessions? What I wanted to say real quick to this one is what I would talk to your psychiatrist about Typically, um, if the medicine for ADD 
is a stimulant, we can see that often trigger OCD way worse. And the reason I like to bring this up on this webinar, even though we're not psychiatrists, is because a lot of psychiatrists don't treat OCD medically. They might treat anxiety, et cetera. And so they'll put somebody on an ADD medication that's a stimulant. And then all my clients will report, oh my God, my intrusive thoughts are way worse. So seeing that question, I would definitely first check with your psychiatrist to see if the ADD medication is making it worse. And if maybe a non-stimulant ADD medication would be better. Definitely. I, I'll just add in, um, please make sure they are seeing a psychiatrist who specializes in OCD. We want to make sure somebody isn't getting medication from, say, like a general practitioner or a pediatrician if they're a child or adolescent, because we really want an OCD specialist to be looking at it. We don't expect that medication is going to have this great relief day two, right? Sometimes it takes time for there to be an effective therapeutic dose or, or timing for them to see effects. But overall, medication shouldn't make things drastically worse. And so I would want them talking to the psychiatrist and figuring out what's going on. Yeah, I know for me, just as a personal note, when I first got on my medications, it made a lot of stuff worse. And I remember it's actually Dr. Jenna Key, um, something my mom found from him that explained that a lot of times medication, your symptoms will rise in the beginning. And so I'm glad I stuck with it. And then after I was on my stable dose, it went down. Right. But I think if it's been long term, right? You yeah, yeah. Then definitely talk to your psychiatrist. Yeah, yeah um, but either way, talk to the psychiatrist. Yeah. Charmaine asked at 1217, um, do we know whether uh, menopause impacts OCD? For sure. You know, so um, we actually just did a webinar, I think it was last week, right, Chris, on postpartum OCD. And we know that hormonal changes and um, the way that our body responds, some people, for example, menopause or even females being on their cycle have different responses and, and the way that it impacts them can be very different. And again, when there are changes in life, whether it's external or internal, so hormonal, biological changes or external changes, you're moving, you're going to college, you're going back to school, you're going through a hard time, a divorce, a you know, what life change, we expect and understand that OCD will increase and be exasperated. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think we know that there's definitely an impact. I don't know exactly what the impact is. I'm sure there is some research on it. And so we'll do some homework and hopefully be able to get some of that data as well. Maybe we could do a whole webinar on just like hormones and OCD and talk a little bit about menopause, talk about um, all different hormonal changes that both men and women experience and go through that and talk about the way it impacts OCD. That would be good because, I mean, you know, obviously the research shows that people typically show first signs like before, like exactly. as puberty starts, as puberty ends, perinatal process, menopause. So it, 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 to me, there's there's such a connection. I know there's, there is some research because when I wrote my thesis, I found research on it because I was like, I know there has to be a hormonal change and they found that. So um, good question. This isn't really a question, but Kelly also wants us to do a webinar um 1221 on OCD and ADHD. And I think that would be good because we see that comorbid a lot. And what a lot of my clients will say is it feels like they're having a tug of war in their head because one, you know, at some points they're very impulsive from the ADHD. Other times they're very cautious because the OCD, the medication for ADHD can sometimes make the OCD worse. How do we know it's ADHD and I'm not just like focused on something interesting versus OCD? So I would say the reason it's important too as school is coming back is because so many teachers misdiagnose, um, not misdiagnosed because they're not diagnosing, but they'll think a kid needs to get help for ADHD and tell the parents when it's really OCD. Um, Sarah Stein at 1220 says, I'm a very thoughtful person and more introverted, but also have OCD. How do I know when something is rumination or compulsion versus me just thinking um, something through? Good question. I'm an introvert myself and my husband is not. And when I get home from work, I want to be by myself and he wants to talk and I need time. Right. So <laughs> here's what I always say. If something feels urgent, like I have to solve this right now, I need to understand this immediately or I can't move forward without having the answer it may be more OCD, right? OCD doesn't really allow us to be inquisitive, to kind of explore in a healthy way, to think things through. OCD, it's loud and we have to answer it, right? It needs to be solved. It needs to be figured out. Compared to, there are many things in life, even if I have an interaction with a friend that leaves me feeling a little bit off, right? I may ruminate about it, but it's not OCD rumination, but I may be ruminating about whether or not my friend's doing okay, what could be going on, 
um, if I might have said something, but in maybe a more healthier way compared to OCD latches on. And I think, is my friend upset with me? Did I do something wrong? I call them to make sure they don't answer. I send them a text message. I'm panicked about it. And I need an answer right now. I need to know things are okay and they're not mad, right? That's a very different response compared to like, oh, I'm just trying to understand that situation. And so I think, again, what I want you to think about is the function. Is the function of the rumination or compulsion to solve something, to have an answer and to know for sure compared to just to, to think about something, to better ex- understand it, to, to have more clarity around it. And that's very different. Yeah. There, um, there is a question that I think uh, you can answer too. Uh, Jacqueline says at 1223, my daughter has not gotten help in dealing with OCD and depression for years. I have an opportunity to get her into the Rogers uh, program. Is it a good program? Absolutely. You know, I want you to think about what I really want and I'll push is that the one of the most important things is are people going to OCD specialty programs, right? And so the fact that they're able to offer programs that are OCD specialty programs, there can be amazing outcomes. And so, of course, I can't say for sure this is the right program for your daughter or the wrong and they can't either, right? It's really about what are your options and being able to weigh out which options make the most sense. And so I want people to look at what are my options. And if there's an option that has an OCD specialty program, I definitely want someone to consider that over like a general psych unit. Yeah. And I'll add, cause she asked a part two at 1226 about transitioning after Rogers for independence. If you can sometimes like, um, you know, I, having a therapist linked up right after is helpful so that once they complete a program like Rogers, they might start with a partial hospital or residential and move to like an IOP, um, seeing a therapist. But what I'd always say to people is, you know, one thing I do as a clinician, when a client walks in and we're doing, we do an IOP here and I'll always ask them like, what does your life look like at home now? And what do you want it to look like? So I can make the therapy look like what it's going to be when they return home. And like, for instance, if a client, you know, is in college and they always go to a coffee shop and sit and they have a bunch of compulsions at a coffee shop, I'm taking us to a coffee shop. We're going to do exposures there. We're going to practice being there because that way when they get home, even though I'm not going to be sitting next to them, it translates back to that. So one thing I suggest is like when your daughter goes to Rogers, just being really open, like these are the things I need help with. I need to be independent when I return home. How can I make my therapy look as much like home as I can? Um, All right, Chris, I'm going to start throwing some at you so you can get a bit of a breather. Um, So I know that there was a question about OCD, ADHD. We're writing this down. Some of these are okay. Um, From Jesse at 1225 PM, I've recovered from OCD before in the past. I find this one is different because I was drinking and I'm dealing with false memories. The thought that this one is different because it keeps holding me back. So just kind of, can you share a little bit about how when OCD morphs and when it's a new subtype and what individuals can do? Yeah, the reason OCD morphs is because OCD needs to stay active, it needs to be relevant. And if your life is changing, or if you're getting treatment for a subtype, and you get better, then the OCD comes back and tries to hit you with something else. So typically, I know for me, for sure, typically, everybody that I meet, they'll say, Oh, when I was a kid, I had this and maybe as a teen this and then it stuck on that. And so that's why when you're working with your therapist, you really want to talk less about the content after a while, more about the mechanics. I, you know, I was saying that earlier. So I talk to clients like this is how OCD fools you. This is how it appears. These are the ways it speaks to you. This is how we misinterpret it. We try to do this or we try to push that away, et cetera. Here's where your power is. Here's where your strength. Here's what you've done well in treatment. Here's how you can do it in other subtypes. That's why sometimes with clients, I'll talk about all the other subtypes on one of the the final sessions with, you know, they go to groups so they hear about it, but I'll tell them about it. So that way, when they leave treatment, they know there's other subtypes and what to look out for. False memory OCD is really difficult because OCD is trying to convince you something that you've done something that you don't have any memory of doing, but it feels so compelling that we misread that compelling urge as fact. And so what we got to do is recognize the more effort you put into that, the more reality it's going to feel. And so our job is to do less. That's what's great about treatment is we're asking you to do less because it sounds like right now you're doing a lot. I do sometimes see a link with um, alcohol and false memories. So sometimes if people are drinking, it's easier for OCD to kind of plant those false memories. What I will say is that that's why um, 
you know, that's why it's, it's not working to try to figure this one out. I think you said you're trying to figure it out because what you're saying here is I was drinking and now I'm dealing with false memories. So clients will say like, oh, there was a uh, hit and run around this bar that I often frequent. And I don't think I was there that month. Um, I was out of town, but I was drinking when I was back home. So maybe I could have driven down there and hit. So once again, it goes back to all that, that um, uncertainty that OCD likes to use against us. And so you know, once again, the more you try to figure it out, the less clarity you're going to get. So that's not your job. What your job is to change your relationship with the thoughts and feelings and learn that you don't have to respond and answer them because that's the reason they keep coming back. 100%. And so we'll keep going live because I want to make sure we get through all of these today. Um, so Joe Young, one of the things I just want to share based on yours is that remember OCD attacks the things that are really important to us. So we find OCD latch on to the things that scare us, that we don't want to be, that go against who we are as a person. And so that makes sense. So definitely seek treatment so that you can get relief from your OCD. Um, Chris, what helped with your hand washing obsessively? My hands always peel, crack, and bleed. This is from Shay at 11, well, 1236. Yeah, I, I would say the first thing for me is I didn't know how to properly wash my hands. And I remember my therapist taking me to the bathroom and showing me how to do it. And it sounds silly, but I had, you know, OCD had created a new way to wash my hands. Um, I also did it seven by sevens, which is really bad because it was 49 times every time I washed my hands. So um, it was really for me about rules that my therapist helped put in place. So showing me how to properly wash my hands, you know, one pump of soap, gentle washing, 20 seconds at the max, dry off and then move on. The second thing was when to wash your hands. So before meals, if you're using your hands, after meals, if they're sticky from like pizza or buffalo wings, um, before putting contacts in, I don't have contacts, but that's a rule that I tell clients, you know, they, they're supposed to. Um, if your hands are visibly like oil, you're changing, you know, something on your tire or after the restroom and not to wash your hands any of those times. And so then my job was to really get to a point to only follow those rules. And so that really helped. The other thing is um, my doctor, actually, I went to the doctor to try to get some special lotion for my hands because it was so bad. And she explained to me that I was actually creating cuts in my hands, which made them more susceptible for um, bacteria and other illnesses. So I started to learn that giving into OCD was actually making it more likely for my fear to happen. So I started putting stuff on it, having them heal, only washing my hands when necessary, using a gentle soap and really recognizing that the only reason I was washing my hands was to quench anxiety, not really to keep me safe because it was keeping me unsafe. 100%. Um, Sarah, I'll just answer your question quickly about meds. You know, I really want you to see a psychiatrist. So even if your GP prescribed meds that's on the IOCDF website, it is really important and we recommend that you see an OCD specialist for medication. So this is a psychiatrist who specializes in OCD just to ensure that what, make, what you're on makes sense and that that's the best dose for you and so that they can oversee it. Um, hi, Eric. So good to see you. I have both OCD and ADHD, and I'm seeing a psychiatrist who specializes in OCD. After years of treating it, we just added meds for the ADHD, but we're being very cautious about it. Low dose. Um, then, then I take the OCD anxiety at bedtime. If they know both conditions well, they can both be treated. So absolutely, right? So it's important to know that any psychiatrist should know both OCD and ADHD, but they're, if they're an OCD specialist, they absolutely should know both. And so again, this is where we want them to navigate what makes sense for your uh, medication regimen and treatment, not us or even a psychologist. Um, da, 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 da. Laura at 1243, my whole family likes to judge my mental illness and severe OCD. Why is that? Yeah, it's misunderstanding and it's a lack of education. Um, OCD, we, you know, used to be called like the silent, you know, illness because a lot of times people can't see it or people don't see the distress that we're under. So they just don't understand why we can't top, stop touching that or why we have to drive around the block again or why we're back in our room praying, right? I would always say that you want to figure out what media your loved one consumes? Are they a podcast listener? Do they like shows? Do they like documentaries? Do they like written articles to read? And you want to provide them from resources. So obviously, I'm going to always throw back to the IOCDF.org. But you want to find resources in the way that they learn and provide it to them and say, look, I understand 
that you don't understand the disorder and you think by bullying me or making fun of me or putting me down or judging me is going to help. In fact, it really makes it worse. And I understand that maybe it's coming from a place of love. Like you really don't want to see me in distress. So because you don't feel like you can talk to me about it, you're going to bully or judge, or maybe you're just being cruel, but here's showing that the DM and the psych, you know, the, the psych, psychiatric community uh, recognize it as a severe disorder. So I'd really like you to read this. I know you love to read books or you listen to this podcast and you love podcasts. I'd love for you to get some more information so that you could support me. 100%. I'm sorry. Um, Leanne, I'm just going to kind of go over your, you, you mentioned a few things about how just it's hard to get a good antibiotic ointment and what's going on with your hands. And we definitely, if our hands um, are chapped, red, bleeding, we want you to seek out medical treatment to ensure there's not an infection and that they can address it. But what we really want to focus on, too, is why they're becoming chapped, bleeding, and raw, right? And that's the OCD contamination and hand washing, if that's what's going on for you. And so we definitely want you to seek specialized treatment so they don't have to get to that level. Mary Beth, there are providers who specialize in both OCD and substance use disorder. I definitely recommend checking out iocdf.org to learn more. There's also been webinars and different events specific to OCD and substance use disorder, and we want the treatment to go hand in hand. That is really important. Amita Health out in Chicago also has a comorbid track for OCD and substance use, um, which is an incredible resource. Okay. Um, Emily at 1248, even when I'm not doing any physical compulsions or engaging in rumination, I still feel this long lasting urge to give in to the compulsion. Is it normal to be very uncomfortable during ERP? Yeah. So let's say you're not doing the compulsions. You're not engaging in rumination. First of all, congrats. That's awesome, Emily. What it is, is what I like to tell clients is focus less on you, how you feel and more on your accomplishment. So let's say you haven't, um, ever gone in a rental car because you're afraid it's contaminated, but you're going on a trip with your family and you guys get a rental car and you're in it and you're not doing compulsions, you're not ruminate, you're having a good time, but you feel uncomfortable. Recognize if you've avoided a rental car for so long, there's going to be a negative association and that may be why you're still feeling discomfort. So if you start to fixate on the discomfort, then that becomes kind of compulsive. We bring that anxiety up and then we fixate on it. I remind clients like feelings are temporary, even good ones. You know, it's our birthday. We're happy. We're celebrating, but we're not going to three months later be just as happy about our birthday. So feelings fade over time. So recognizing that discomfort um, is a temporary experience. It will pass when your body allows it, but focus more on the accomplishment that you just did. That's awesome. The second thing I'd say is typically the reason we feel discomfort when doing treatment is because we've created so many safety behaviors for years. And we've convinced ourselves that these things are dangerous. So when you make that bold move to fight against it and start to live in your values, you're going to feel that first line of defense. Your, your OCD is going to make you feel discomfort. But it's reminding yourself, I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable because I'm doing something bold, brave, and something to get my life back. And I always remind clients, you're doing it for your future self. So maybe right. the first two, three, four times you feel discomfort, but over time you start to realize like, no, this isn't dangerous. I like being in a rental car. It's nicer than the one I drive. So, hey, so. That's right. I love it. I love it. Um, next question is, how do you find a psychiatrist that specializes in OCD? Yeah, so there's two ways. Obviously, going to iocdf.org, find dash help. The other thing that's really good is ask your therapist. So I know for me, um, anytime I have a client who's on medication, I'll ask them, do you really like your med your, do you really like your psychiatrist? And if they say, um, yes, no, they're great. They understand OCD. They see a lot of clients with OCD. I'll get their information, send out an email, ask them some questions to make sure. And then I put them on a referral list. And so I'll have like a long referral list of maybe 10 or 15 psychiatrists that specialize in OCD in Orange County or LA or San Diego. So if you don't find one off the website, ask your therapist, or if you don't have a therapist currently, call a therapist near you and just say, hey, I'm looking for a psychiatrist at this time. Is there anybody that you work with that you know understands OCD? Absolutely. Um, let's see other questions. It looks like we've answered most of it. Um, yeah. So do we want to actually, it, we only have five minutes. So we're not going to hop back to the live. Um, share. So 
what should we talk about? Let me think. I'm going to give a couple updates, and then if there's any last-minute questions, please submit them. First update, Chris and I are working really hard to get through y'all's questions. There are so many. So I did go through some. Chris and I are due to go through more. It looks like, as I'm looking at, sorry, when y'all see me all over the place, by the way, I'm looking at all the different questions and stuff we have submitted. But we've got about a page and a half left of questions to get through. And so hopefully, well, sorry, three pages. Skyla's probably like, what are you talking about, Liz? And so <laughs> we will get through those, I promise you, because we want to get caught up because our goal is that if we're caught up on those, we can spend the whole time engaging with you guys here. And so we will be able to do that. And we're just excited to be able to work together with everyone. Thank you all so much for your questions. And what I want to say across the board is that remember, treatment is incredible. Treatment is amazing and it can give you freedom from OCD. It won't give you freedom today. It gives you freedom tomorrow and forever, right? It's not just about short-term freedom. It's about long-term freedom. And that's what we're fighting for. What we know is that with effective care and treatment, you can use um, these resources, you know, to fight any subtype of OCD, but that doesn't mean sometimes we don't need a little refresher or a little bit of an update. That's what these webinars are for. That's also what your clinicians are for. Don't ever hesitate. I always tell a patient, I would much rather you reach out to me and for us to do a refresher than for you to feel like you shouldn't do that and you wait until it's really impacting your life, right? If you start to see an uptick, reach out. Don't wait because waiting can be the difference between OCD progressing and not. Um, Chris, I will let you share your information if you want to. There is a couple that have asked to reach out to you. And so that is up to you if and how you want to share it. Um, but of course, it's great to see everyone. Help and hope are always available. Chris, I'll toss it over to you. Yeah. So somebody was at, a couple were asking for my information. So Skyla is going to put it on the um, bottom, but you can email me. So it's my name. So Chris Tronson and then at gatewayocd.com. So just my name, Chris, T-R-O-N-D-S-E-N at gatewayocd.com. So you can definitely reach out. Um, you know, uh, one thing I, I always go back to because I see another medication question. Um, one thing that Liz and I will do on one of the Ask the Experts coming up is we'll ask another psychiatrist back on. The reason I always, I always want to explain this because I, I think Liz and I just take it for granted. We don't recognize it that other people might not know. But when it comes to scope of practice and scope of confidence, competence and kind of like scope of um, what a therapist can or cannot do, a psychologist can or cannot do is therapists and psychologists and counselors cannot prescribe medication. And we can give direction, but we can't give advice. We can't talk about certain things. And so if we don't answer a medication question, it's not because we don't care. We absolutely love you and your questions, of course, but I uh, love helping you and your questions, of course. But um, a psychiatrist is going to be better versed, just like Liz and I are constantly up to date on the latest research and we're seeing clients and we're going to conferences and we're listening to conferences and speaking. They're doing the same with medication. So they're getting updated information on medication. So we will definitely um, we have meetings every Every other Tuesday about these lives. So we'll definitely talk about getting another psychiatrist on. We could definitely um, get those questions because I see your question, Elena, and it sounds like your friend is going through heck um, trying to get a medication that works. And so um, that would be a question we could definitely ask. I know Mr. Papa asked about OCD staring. There's a really good webinar that we have with Jonathan Grayson. So if you go to iocdf.org or sorry, youtube.com slash iocdf, when you go on to um, IOCDF's YouTube page, if in the search you click like staring, compulsive staring or Jonathan Grayson, that will pop up. So definitely, definitely check out um, that webinar. Yes, I am just like Liz did. I am uh, due to do those questions. So I'll get on it as well. Um, that way I can make sure that we get our list caught up. Um, somebody asked, what is the IOCDF? So it's the International OCD Foundation. So I always tell people it's kind of like how there's like a heart foundation. There's like cancer and stuff like that. Um, this is ours. And so that's why Liz and I love it because we love uh, giving help. So thank you so much, everyone. Oh, see, Skyla's already on it. So for you, there's the compulsive staring. Um, we'll be back next week. I just wanted to really quick talk about next week. Uh, Liz and I are excited about it. And we have a couple guests coming on. If Liz wants to talk about the guests, I know she knows them better than I do. But um, we're going to do a talk on OCD and language. So, you know, um, a lot of times, sometimes people talk about like, is it cure? Or is it not cure? Is somebody a treatment refuser? Like, what is that? So we'll talk about the importance of language. So um, it'll be like a, a special um, lunch and learn. So we really hope that you can make it same time next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern. Um, and then we have uh, guests. Do you want to talk about our guests real quick? 
Yeah, so we have incredible guests. I, I know that we'll be joining next week who are clinicians in the field. And really the reason we, they're both clinicians. One is a clinician advocate, one's a clinician, but we really wanted to us to talk a little bit about the way language impacts, not just those of us that seek treatment, the way we understand treatment, but also providers and the way you provide treatment. We want to ensure that we're really doing a good job to use appropriate language that we, you know, it's, it's that debate. Should we be using the word cure or not? And it's hard because I think so many of us with OCD kind of cringe at the word cure because we know that it's not what we understand as a cure where it's like you take a medication and it's done, right? It takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. But our other debate, the flip side is by not using the word cure, are we sending the message that you don't get freedom? Because I do want us to remember we are fighting for freedom, not functioning. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about next week. So I'm excited. I think there's a lot to learn, a lot of conversations to be had, and it's really going to be twofold. We're going to talk about language, but we're also going to talk about what treatment should give us and what you should be fighting for that should help influence the language you, you use when you explain and understand OCD. Yeah. Just to end, thank you so much for all the sweet comments for Liz and I in the chat. We definitely take all those to heart. I always go back to the conversation we had at the conference and just how honored we were that people came up and thanked us and talked to us about watching these live streams. So we, we do this as a labor of love and it's so sweet, the comments you give us, but definitely join us next week. Don't forget the special um, uh, round table, research round table Q and A tomorrow at noon Eastern. And Liz and I say, thank you. Thank you yes. for always joining us and we'll see you next Wednesday. We love Take you guys. Care. See you soon. Yes.